and welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. This is an initiative from Cronkite Global Initiatives and we're here to welcome uh, Sweden's ambassador to the US. So uh, please bear with me while I read a small introduction from her really long career. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so she was appointed ambassador of Sweden to the US on September 1st, 2017. She's an accomplished diplomat. Her career in the Foreign Service started in 1994 with her first posting to the Embassy of Sweden in Moscow. In the years following, she worked in security policy and defense issues, as well as in numerous leadership posts within the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, including serving as Chief of Staff for several of its ministers and director of the minister's office. She has also served as a member of the Swedish delegation to NATO and at the Swedish EU representation in Brussels, working with European security policy and defense issues. Olof Soder also served as deputy chief of mission at the embassy of Sweden in Washington DC for three years until 2011, until she was appointed ambassador of Sweden to Hungary. A longtime advocate for Swedish trade and diplomatic relations with the United States, the ambassador brings extensive experience in trade promotion to her current post. Prior to assuming the ambassador's role, she served as Director General for Trade at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. She was also um, in the position of Deputy Director General and Head of the Department for Promotion of Sweden Trade and CSR at the Foreign Ministry. She has a BA in Psychology, Economics, and Russian, and she speaks French, Russian, and English. It's a pleasure to have you. I think Welcome. everyone has fallen asleep now. <laughs> well, you're accomplished. Yes. You know, so. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really fantastic to be here. And we just got to know a bit about your program. And we're, we all want to be you and be students here, actually. All right. So are you ready for the very tough questions? Absolutely. Excellent. We'll ask you a couple and then we'll open up to the floor so that we can have an open conversation. So my first question to you is, what does the Swedish-US bilateral relationship look like right now? Well, it's a very good relationship. It's been very good for a long time. And just as a curiosity fact, we actually came, the first Swedes and Finns came to the United States already in 1638. And we established a colony in Delaware called, surprise, New Sweden. And this was at the time when Sweden was a huge power in Europe and everyone should you know, have a footprint uh, here on the new continent. Unfortunately, the Dutch beat us after 15 years, uh, but still. But if you go to Wilmington, if you go to Delaware, you can actually stay, sail on a replica of the exact boat uh, that came over. So it's made to like 18th century, uh, 17th century. Anyway, so um, uh, then like everyone else, most countries in Europe, we had a, long, a big emigration to the United States in the 19th century. So today, four or five million Americans claim Swedish heritage. And you talked about Chicago. Uh, that whole area feels very Swedish with a lot of Swedish surnames and so on. Today, we have a new influx of Swedes coming for, uh, for um, companies. We are the 15th largest investor in the United States. Lots of big companies, all the startups. Uh, I don't know if you know that Spotify is Swedish, for instance, and the payment service Klarna and other traditional services. So big footprint, we have great cooperation with the US when it comes to democracy, human rights, uh, development, cooperation, um, trade, I said, we don't say eye to eye on all issues when it comes to trade, we're a free trading country. 50% uh, of our GDP actually comes from trade with others. So we are, that worries us a bit. We have a huge defense uh, relationship as well. Uh, it's a surprise to many, I think, given that Sweden is where it is. And we've also been uh, militarily non-aligned for since 1814. <laughs> and we're not a member of NATO, but we really build our security together with others. So uh, defense relationship with the United States is good and it's very strong. So I would say uh, most, for the most of it, it's a very good relationship. We don't see eye to eye on everything. So what are some of the companies that are making way here from Sweden into the US uh, that are shaping up the economy or that could be in the future a good ally for promoting the relationship between Sweden and the US? Well, as I said, we are uh, really a country of, uh, of big companies, but also startups. But we, as I said, we're the 15th largest investor here. That's bigger than China, Brazil and Mexico. Yeah, uh, but smaller than the Netherlands. 
<laughs> no, but anyway, so it's everything from companies like Ericsson, who is driving the future when it comes to 5G technology. It's uh, SKF, uh, inventor of the ball bearing. It's ABB in the energy field. It's uh, SSAB in uh, steel making. It's Securitas, one of the largest security companies in the US. They employ 100,000 people. And then we have, as I said, Spotify and, and Klarna, so that whole new sector as well. So lots of the companies that are driving you know, development when it comes to climate smart solutions, and all, they are all here. Uh, and uh, they're, I think for European companies or Swedish companies, they all want to try the American market because you kind of make it big when you go to America. It's not always as easy as people perceive. It's easier to go to Norway where most companies go. Uh, but uh, a lot of them want to try out. Good, good. I mean, competition here is tough, uh, but we are seeing more and more Swedish products in the streets. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the electric cars coming from mm -hmm. Sweden, and I cannot wait to try one out. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, the world looks up to Sweden for a number of issues. Um, and in 2014, Sweden became the first government in the world to call itself feminist. So why and how did this decision come about? And what does it mean to be a feminist government? Well, uh, it's interesting, it took a man to declare a feminist government, so our prime minister, who's actually resigning as we speak and handing over the baton to another, uh, the first female party, or the first female most likely prime minister of Sweden. And uh, so it took a man to do this, but it's been long in the making. Uh, we have had very strong gender policies for a long time and um, started out already in the 70s where we abolished joint taxation for men and women, so that led to more women out in the labor market. We also got chi affordable childcare for everyone, because if women were going to enter the labor market, there had to be affordable childcare. Uh, there were other measures taken as well. We introduced the first father daddy month in parental leave. Today we have 480 days of parental leave, so for us it's quite interesting to follow the debate here about the week here and there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but and three of those four, three months of those 480 days are designated to one parent, for instance. So that is trying to get more men. So, working on gender issues has always been a strong development in my country. Then in 2014, I think people have had had enough that it wasn't going fast enough. So by declaring a feminist government, it meant that all governments, um, all ministries, all areas of policy, we always have to do gender analysis, for instance, when we do a new legislation. So if you look at, for instance, traffic, it can be how do we light uh, the streets so that it's safe for people, for women also feel safe to walk, for instance. Uh, so that's uh, on the domestic agenda, but then also on the foreign policy agenda, we then um, uh, we instituted uh, the three R's, rights, representation and resources. Women should have exactly the same rights, legal rights as men, same access to resources, of course, economic development, and the same right to representation. And we are more than 50% of the population. I think this is a way of showing that you through all your political work, if you put your gender glasses on, you can actually change. So it's really putting women's and, and, and girls' development at the center. And we realize, for instance, when you do peace negotiations, many times there are no women around, but they are, of course, instrumental to making peace and security come about in the local communities and also on a national level. So it's a way of always highlighting this in whatever we do. Of course, it's uh, a slow process, but uh, many more governments have followed now and also having a feminist. And it was quite interesting because I worked at home at the time when, when this was um, introduced and everyone was like, why do you call it feminist? That's like such a strong word. And then the prime minister said like, yeah, if I would call it gender equal policy, no one would ever take notice. You have to be a bit out there. So uh, Swedish, the present Swedish government, government is, is a feminist, declared feminist government. And that doesn't mean that we are, that they are you know, looking, not doing things for boys and men, because that's also a very important uh, focus area. How do we focus on boys and men and their responsibilities in society and uh, when it comes to education and so on? So it's not that it's exclusive, but it's just that we, we really need to focus on women and girls' rights so that we become equal. 
So what advice would you have for women in the building that are interested in pursuing a career in communications in a field that we tend to get a lot of women to enroll in majors, but then when it comes to the actual job market, it's still, in most cases, a field dominated by men. Um, what advice would you give women? Yes, I think I also come from a field of work which has been uh, dominated by men, at least at the higher positions. Uh, right now, we, inst for instance, have about half and half female ambassadors. Uh, so that's something. I have never really in my career thought about myself as that I'm a woman diplomat. It's actually when I first got this job, because I am the first female ambassador to the US. So sometimes I think that one shouldn't oneself pay attention to it. but just see yourself as a very as a professional and then if i mean this it's so hard to say because it's all individual situations and you know there are always these techniques where women help each other and you repeat what the other person said and i mean there's so many things you can do but i think it is to really believe in yourself and your professionalism uh, and also call out those men who are treating you uh, badly but it's so easy to say all these things i know all situations are different and cultures are different and so on. But I have been fortunate in that I haven't really had to think about it so much. And also I've chosen uh, typically male areas, security policy in Russia. We were not, I was the only female diplomat in Moscow, for instance, at our embassy. And uh, security policy has also been a field where mostly men have been active. So, but I didn't really think about that. So, I'm going to change a little bit the, the course of a, of a conversation now to focus on the COP26 that is underway as we meet here today. Um, and it's following the G20 meeting of last week. So what are Sweden's climate ambition? Well, we are very ambitious. Uh, and as I said, we're a highly industrialized uh, country with lots of industries in kind of before climate unfriendly businesses such as mining, transportation, cement, construction, and, and all that. But so we have taken, the government has said that we will be the first fossil um, uh, net zero uh, greenhouse gas emission welfare state by 2045. So it's an ambitious target. But this, of course, recalls for very close collaboration between government, academia, and industry to make this transformation. And also, um, uh, I think it's possible, but it's extremely difficult. Uh, I personally drive a car that omits way too much. So first you have to get, how, how do you get incentives for people to change? But then also uh, at the society level. So uh, in my country, a lot of the industry is actually driving change voluntarily because the consumers want this. In my country, there is agreement on climate change. It's never debated if it is or not. <laughs> it's more like how fast do we go about change? So uh, the industry uh, has realized that this is smart for them. It's growth uh, and it's the right thing to do. So there are, we have a, something called Fossil Free Sweden, which is kind of a, an in, initiative where 22 or 25 different business sectors have taken it on themselves to be net zero uh, omitters by certain different years. So we actually now have come up with the first carbon free steel in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, it's actually uh, right now being tried out by Volvo Group who do, does trucks, they make mining equipment as well as well. So they have uh, out of this carbon free steel produced the first kind of mining vehicle <laughs> that's operating in, in, in the north of Sweden. But this steel will be on the market in a couple of years. Uh, that's revolutionary. And uh, the cement industry on, is on its way of cracking the code and so on. And um, yeah, I think this is how it has to go about. It has to be kind of, there has to be push from, from government, but it has to also come, come out of that we as consumers, this is what we demand and what we want. Of course, it can be more costly initially, but it, it's, we just have to do it. Yeah, and we're seeing that more and more consumers can voice out their concerns, yeah. especially with the rise of social media that is allowing for two way communication with companies. Um, and you mentioned that one of the key areas that is driving climate change is actually self regulation by some of these businesses. So what incentives does your government offer for companies that self regulate and how could we here learn in the US from that experience? 
Well, there have been uh, tax credits for some of these kind of things. And uh, for instance, this is an old uh, example, but in the 1970s, in the oil crisis, there was uh, tax incentives or yeah, deductions for people who installed three glass windows, which really cut down our energy consumption. Uh, so that was one way of doing it. If you refit your house, you get incentives to do it. And then, of course, that grows the market for those kind of products. So that's how it's done. In Stockholm, we have, uh, you know, um, what do you call toll roads going in for climate reasons, uh, so that you shouldn't drive if you don't have to. Uh, it's not to finance the roads. It's actually to, to make it less or more difficult or more expensive to drive. So those are the issues that are some measures that are being taken. Excellent. So what is your view of the result of the G20 meeting of last week? Well, I think it was positive. Then, of course, the proof is in the pudding or the eating of the pudding or how you say it. <laughs> it's easy to say a lot of things. And I think uh, uh, the civil society is, of course, uh, critical and wondering if this will be realized. But if we don't take bold polit political decisions, we will never get anywhere. So at least it's very good ambitions, but then we will have to see if they manage it. And we have, have a process in my country where each, uh, the one, the parties who are in government have to report to the parliament every year on what kind of climate actions they have taken. So this is a way of, of you know, holding uh, the politicians or the government accountable to the people. So I, I think you have to institute mechanisms like that as well, and then pair it with innovation. So Sweden right now is the current chair of the OSCE. What are Sweden's priorities in its regional international security cooperation, and what does Sweden's security policy look like? Well, as I said earlier, uh, we are a militarily non-aligned country, uh, which means that we are not a member of NATO. Um, this does not mean that we have, uh, I mean, it, it means that because of this and because of our history, we have a very strong defense. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that we have actually not been in a war since 1814. Before that, we were at war all the time. So one reason, for instance, why so many people left Sweden was that we were so poor after all these wars. Uh, so one reason was poverty coming out of that. Anyway, so we build our security together with uh, Finland, very close cooperation uh, with the United States, as I said initially, uh, because we were not part of NATO after the Cold War and not the Warsaw Pact either, of course, we had to uh, build a very trustworthy military industry. We have a huge military industrial complex uh, for our size. We're one of the biggest in, I think we're top 10 big in the world or something like that. So we build our own submarines, our own fighter jets uh, and so on. We are spending much more on our defense right now because we see uh, you know, instability in our region, uh, Russia's actions on Ukraine, Georgia and so on. Also how they operate in the Baltic Sea gives us uh, cause for worry. So we are now, increasing our defense spending by 40% till 2025. So this means that uh, we will buy much more equipment, many more regiments and so on. But then we are also so very active in the multilateral fora. So we took uh, the presidency of the OSCE, that's the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, during this year, and there we focus on the human dimension. So how, if you want to have stable security situation, you really have to have a strong democracy and respect for human rights. So that's been the focus of that. We are taking over the presidency of the European Union, spring of 23. And uh, this is also an important uh, area then to continue. And for a small country, you know, the respect for international law is paramount to our security because if the bigger countries just start starts acting freely and not respect like what happened with ukraine when we will, will we be gobbled up and will no one pay you know pay attention then if we don't hold countries accountable according to the laws that we have actually agreed upon so for us this is very serious and we were very worried during the trump administration that the united states was going to pull back from a lot of these multilateral fora but uh, now that's not the case, but still, uh, we don't feel we can really rest. <laughs> so steering us back into the uh, mass communication umbrella, I'm going to ask you at least what I think is going to be my last question. Um, we'll see. But um, how does Sweden support 
the freedom of the press? Well, uh, actually, uh, we have uh, in our constitution since 1766, so before the United States that prides itself on its constitution, we were there before. Uh, it's in our con constitution that uh, authorities have to be able to be held accountable and also freedom right the right to information and freedom of press so it goes back a long 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 time nationally we have um, uh, government support state support for media uh, so and that is a way to keep uh, our uh, uh, how do you say media uh, working. working and that you will have we will have diverse sources of media available uh, so that's an important tool for the government. That does not mean that, that it's steered at all. That's, of course, illegal. Uh, so that's important. Then we, we are one of the countries, one of the few countries in the world that we give 1% of GDP to development cooperation. And a lot of the focus of our development cooperation goes to democracy and freedom of speech and media uh, working, you know, to make, uh, try to create security for journalists and, and so on. So it's a big, big chunk of how we cooperate around the world uh, with countries where this is a challenge. Um, I think that that's excellent. Um, I come from a country in which the state really manipulates the, the public opinion based on the distribution of advertising resources, and they do have strict laws for the media, so the, the media is always being curved by the state. So it's encouraging to hear that there is models that we can look up to and, and learn from. We're not perfect, but Good. yes. And actually, I just want to, uh, you know, we take this very seriously, uh, racism and, uh, you know, uh, social media and all that we just had a, something called malme forum where we highlighted that it's 20 years ago since we formed the international holocaust remembrance uh, association and uh, so the forum it was a um, high level uh, forum to talk about anti-semitism and racism and so on and also on media and how can we educate our children to be media knowledgeable and how you know we create critical thinking when it comes to social media so that you can spot racism anti-semitism or what have you uh, and, and i think we really need to and that's something I, I guess you discuss here too how do we how do we make our children um, resilient so to speak towards these kind of fake news and whatever is going on in in this media that we cannot uh, control yeah, this uh, past week we celebrated Media Literacy Week here at Cronkite, and Thursday was a global day, so we discussed with some of the Humphreys actually what are some of the challenges in the spread of misinformation and disinformation across the world, and we are seeing that we follow very similar patterns, even in countries that are very dissimilar, but there is a prevalence of disinformation and misinformation that gets distributed specifically through social media and channels like WhatsApp or Telegram, where there is very little oversight into what's being shared. Um, but I could chat with you for hours and ask you questions, but I'm going to actually open the floor to Cronkite students and, and staff to ask you questions. And, and we have on, it can number. be on anything, really anything. So if you could please line up for the questions and go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Milana. I came from Russia. I am a Chechen journalist working with the BBC Russian service in Moscow. And before going to the relationships between our countries, I would like to tell a little bit about my personal relationships with your country. So it starts from the Scandinavian mythology, of course, and you mentioned here that the, all the protections that you have. Uh, in your country, but we all know that your main weapon is Odin, of course, and Thor, <laughs> and you have this female government because of Valkyria effect. So the second thing that connected me to your country is, uh, of course, I'm a journalist, video journalist, is uh, the Swedish noir, all this uh, uh, criminal TV series, and uh, I can't uh, not mention the TV series Bridge. And that's why I went to the Malmö a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, here I wanted to tell a little bit why I went to the Malmö. 
there was an accident uh, with a Chechen uh, man in uh, in Swedish, Sweden. His name is Tumso Abdurrahmanov, and he is opponent of the Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov. And there is an attack. At attack, the, the man was attacked because of his uh, YouTube channel. He was telling things about uh, Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, the criminal cases in Chechnya, the torture and killing people in Chechnya. And after that, uh, I can't say that it was the how to say, order of Ramzan Kadyrov, but someone came to Sweden and attacked using the. Um, the very specific weapon, I can't, I, I don't know the word, sorry, uh, help, uh, hammer, hammer using the hammer, he attacked this man. And uh, after that, he was arrested. So my question is, if you know this case, uh, I know that it's not your, your area now, but you, you were working in Moscow, maybe you're still following all these stories. Uh, is there anything changed related to the political refugees in Sweden after that case, or maybe not related to that case in general? Is there any extra protection for uh, political refugees in Sweden nowadays? Thank you. Well, I'm sorry that I don't know the particular case, uh, but I know of, 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 of course, Chechnya and, and uh, refugees and so on. Yes, I mean, in Sweden, you can always apply for political asylum um, and have your, uh, have your case tried. So I know we, we have quite a lot of uh, political refugees in my country. And um, also, uh, you know, the last few years, given what has going on in Syria and uh, Afghanistan and so on, we have taken in a lot of a lot of refugees. One hundred fifty thousand people actually came in two thousand fifteen. So this is now a big debate in my country on how many how many refugees should we be able to take and how can we integrate people into our societies and so on. But I'm sorry, I don't know the particular case. Hi, Ambassador. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, I'm a master's student uh, doing journalism. So, yeah, sweet, the Scandinavian countries, we all know it's, they are so great in everything. It's so uh, awesome. And, but um, you're in the US and you see it's a diverse place. It's not like Sweden. You can see everywhere. Uh, what are the conversations or discussions you are hearing about like how this country can be united, have a similar perspective? Because Sweden, you do it well, because people are similar. Well, I think in a way that's a myth that we're similar. Today, 20% of Swedes are actually born in another country or have a foreign born parent. So uh, right now uh, we have elections next year and um, a lot of the political debate is about how do we integrate people from other countries into our environment because we have a very generous policy on refugees uh, and so on as I just said in 2015 um, 150,000 people came to, to our country that's 10 million people. So how do we make sure that people who come and get asylum get into the labor market how do we make sure that they learn Swedish, that they are integrated and, and you know, that it works well for them? Because if we don't, it creates a lot of tension within our society and it feeds racism and it feeds, uh, you know, those kinds of movements. So uh, we also right now, I don't know if you have paid attention, um, we have quite a lot of problems with organized crime and drugs, uh, drug smuggling and selling and shootings. I think we have most shootings in Europe right now per capita. So uh, there's actually a great series on Netflix called Snabba Cash. You should watch it. It's uh, two films and then it's a mini series of six episodes. It really describes quite well the situation and it's, it's really good TV as well. It's called Snab, Snabba Fast Cash. Um, anyway, so, so uh, a lot of the challenges that we see here in the United States, we have similar challenges. Uh, in our, in our society. So I think it's, it's not as rosy as it's maybe perceived. Uh, but of course, I mean, in general, our society is doing very well and uh, people are, you know, having 
fairly good lives and in comparison to so many other places, but we do have challenges. Okay, thank you so much. This is Tasneem from Palestine. I have my own experience actually working with SIDA for 15 years in Palestine West Bank. They uh, support media sector in uh, Birzeit University at Media uh, Development Center where I work. So uh, they have a huge impact and development in media and that's really appreciated for that. My question or discussion, it will be about uh, Mr. Biden yesterday. He, in his speech, he said, uh, climate change equal opportunities. So what's your advice? You can share it with uh, undergraduate student in media, how they can grab this kind of opportunities to make the new uh, market in media. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Actually, we are proof that you can both uh, change and grow your economy. So since 1990, our carbon emissions are down by 30% and we have grown our economy by 86%. So it's really, really possible. And what has happened in, in my country is that, you know, the new industries are employing new people. So you both have to have a way of transforming your education system to match the needs of tomorrow's companies. Uh, but also, uh, as we talked about earlier, how do we drive the incentives uh, for the consumers to, to change as well? But so, so it's kind of when politicians say that you cannot both, you know, be climate friendly and green and have a strong economy, that's actually not true. But you have to have a way of transforming your societies. So for instance, and this doesn't only have to do with climate, it has to do with businesses going out of, you know, they are not uh, profitable anymore and they're closing down. So we have a system um, where um, it's actually the trade unions and the employers associations 80% of workers in Sweden are unionized, by the way. So uh, there's an agreement between the trade unions and the employers association. So if you have a big industry that, you know, is going, has gone down, there is, uh, if you're a member of the union and you've paid into this kind of mechanism that they have with the employers association, they will ask you, so what's your dream job? <laughs> you were a miner here or you were working in this factory and you say, Oh, my dream job is a florist and if there's a market for florists they will retrain you and within a year 80 percent of the retrained people actually have a new job so it's a, it's a way of trying to steer people into new areas of work and it's of course not easy for everyone to change but for many people it actually gives them a new future and uh, i'm not saying that this is something that's easy or easily done but it is doable. Uh, so for instance, Malmö that we talked about used to be a huge shipping wharf place. Now they hardly build any boats at all, but people still there have good jobs. So it's, uh, it's kind of a collaboration between the employers and, and the, the unions that have worked very well in my country. Um, good morning. Uh, your Excellency and Dr. Mundell, it's, I'm a little nervous because I'm, I'm kind of honored to be here and asking you this question. Okay. And I've written it down so that I don't make a blunder. Uh, my name is Elita, I'm from Dhaka, Bangladesh, and I'm a Humphrey Fellow here. So my, uh, I just wanna say that we, most of us belong uh, to a world where we are still struggling between the idea of um, balancing work and life. Uh, and many couples are still, um, faced with the challenge of choosing between children and career. And you did mention that Sweden has actually one of the best childcare plans in the world, starting from right after the child is born. So both the parents can actually take maternity and a paternity leave of 480 days each and are also provided several kinds of parental leaves while actively at work. So my question is, how has this current plan, the parental childcare plan in Sweden, made an impact nationwide um, in your country in terms of economic development. Thank you. Well, as I said, 80% of women in Sweden work. <clears throat> I think this number for the United States is around 60% or so. So uh, first of all, it was the taxation issue that I talked about. Then it was instituting, uh, you know, good uh, daycare uh, for kids. So usually in Sweden right now, people or kids go to daycare when they're one and a half years old. So they stay at home with their parents till one or one and a half year. 
And that's because of this gen very generous parental leave, where you have up to a certain li limit, you have 80% of your, your income uh, during that time. And then also, as I said, the three months are reserved for one parent. So if one parent doesn't take at least three months, those months are lost. So that's an incentive as well. Is there an echo when I speak? Yeah, um, oh, a, little a little bit. Okay, but anyway, so uh, what we have, uh, the OECD has shown that um, the increase in women's labor participation in the Nordic countries actually stands for 10 to 20% of the race of GDP in our country. So it's really good economics <laughs> to do it as well. And I think uh, if I was a Swedish politician and I met the leader of a country that, you know, with, where women's labor participation would be low, I would, I think, ask, don't you want to grow your economy? Because that's what it's about as well. And then you, of course, get women's liberalization and and economic empowerment coming with it. So uh, I, I really do believe that the way it's been constructed, okay, we do pay uh, quite high taxes, but there's never a debate in Sweden that we pay too high taxes for these kinds of issues or for these kind of services. Uh, and we quite have a, a quite high uh, birth rate numbers in my country as well. And I have many friends or some friends who are you know, partners in law firms women and they all have three to four children because they can so it's uh, it's a sign of that you can be kind of doing everything woman <laughs> which is tough but i'm really a product of this system that i've been able to together with my husband raise two kids uh, and both having interesting jobs at the same time so i this is something i'm really proud of my country you can also line up behind each other so that okay. you can answer questions uh hello ambassador i'm su chi from china i have two questions about climate change uh the first one is the balance of the e uh, ec economic development and uh, the environmental production as we know sweden does very well as a leader for climate change but for uh developing country their first priority is to uh, uh to like in in structure and uh, develop uh, economic development for Nordic country, their first uh, concern is to change their lifestyle. So, how to balance the development, uh, economic development, and climate change uh, among countries at the different level? The second question is: uh, while well, the ten political tensions affect the co co cooperation on climate change, thank you. Well, thank you for two very good questions. Yes, I, I have not, uh, in my work, I haven't visited so many uh, developing countries, but sometimes I feel that we assume that countries that are developing should get like the, the worst technology. <laughs> Why shouldn't we be able to transform, like leapfrogging, you know, like we did with the mobile phones, for instance. Uh, you skipped having regular telephones and then people have mobile phones. So uh, somehow I wonder if, uh, if it's not possible to through, uh, to through the don donor organizations and so on actually leapfrog technology as well. So people in, in the developing countries get access to, to modern technology and, and, and that whatever we are helping them with when it comes to manufacturing or industry and so on can be state of the art instead. Uh, this is probably lots easier said than done, uh, but I, I, I do think that that would be possible. And also, um, given that Europe and the United States and, and China are the biggest consumption markets, when we, when we also buy from the rest of the world, we can set you know, standards of what, what we want to buy. And that, of course, drives uh, innovation in those other places. I mean, this sounds very easy. I know it's extremely difficult, but we don't have a choice uh, given what the climate looks like. Uh, so we all need to change. And the second question was economic growth or Yes, yes, political tension. When I'm fortunate in that in my country there is not any political tension regarding that climate change is real. Uh, in Sweden there's a more a debate of how fast can we go? And for instance, I think we will have, you're already seeing it, how should we, you know, our energy mix is 40% nuclear power, 40% hydro, because we have uh, big rivers up north. 
and then 12% is, um, is renewables or other renewables. So uh, the question now I think that will come in Sweden and in Europe is like, how do we view nuclear power? Is that considered like a climate friendly renewable source or is it something in between or is it something we should get rid of, uh, for instance? So that, that's a debate that will come. And there, there are political differing views in my country, for instance. Then on a global level, of course, it is very difficult when there are political leaders that are climate deniers. Then I think we all understand that this will go at various speeds in different countries, but I think we can all see now what is happening. And if you just look at the Arctic or the melting permafrost and so on, it's very serious. Good morning, Ambassador. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Kai Hyuk from South Korea. I'm a TV journalist and I'm a Humphrey, Humphrey Fellow. Uh, my question is about the uh, fake news, so-called fake news, misinformation or disinformation. Uh, uh, what is your government view uh, toward uh, this problem, misinformation, especially on social media? And the second question is, uh, do you have any uh, a political uh, I mean, a governmental policy in, in operation now in your country. Can you briefly introduce? Thank yes, you. thank you. No, uh, I think the Swedish government is just as concerned as everyone else. Um, and as I said, we have uh, we are focusing in school on, on, on uh, like online literacy. So already from quite young age in, in the schools, there is programs about this. Uh, how to, to cre teach critical thinking uh, when it comes to, to young, younger children doing this. Then uh, we are just going back to a kind of system we had during the Cold War, where we view our defense not only as a military part of our defense, but also the civil society as part of the defense. So we call it total defense. And this is everything from like, how do we make sure that we have enough food in a crisis time, et cetera. But we are also re re reopening an agency, a government agency, which we closed down. And it's called the Agency for Psychological Defense. And this agency will be tasked with making sure, first of all, looking at this information, spotting that, and they will do that together with uh, the military intelligence and, uh, and other intelligence bodies, of course. How do we spot that on, on the internet? But it will also be the agency that if there is a crisis or war, that the information you get from this agency is what you as a citizen can trust. And I know this sounds a bit weird if you don't trust your government, but in Sweden we have big, huge trust in the government agencies. And uh, as long as that remains, people will you know, rely on that, you know, the messaging coming out of that uh, agency. So for instance, um, four or five years ago, we sent out a brochure to 5 million households in Sweden, which, you know, information, if war or a crisis is coming, what do you do? And like, what kind of news and information can you trust? And it's everything from how, what, what, you, what kind of foodstuffs should you have stocked at home to what kind of media outlets can you trust and so on. Uh, so this is something we are working, working on a lot. Uh, it's a big focus and we just had one a huge ransomware attack, for instance, uh, this summer, where 800 food stores could not uh, had to shut down for a week, because we're also ba basically a cashless society, so no one could buy anything because of this hacker attack. So we see, you know, attacks on our society on so many fronts, both disinformation, but also uh, hacking attacks, ransomware, and so on. So defense has to be so much broader than just military, and you really have to start with the children. Thank you very much, uh, Her Excellency. Um, I am Mohamed Asmiuba. I come from Sierra Leone. I'm also a Humphrey Fellow. My question is, um, your country pushes for more female representation. Well, I said your country pushes for more female representation, and I come from a continent where majority of women are not um, in the decision room, in rooms where decisions are made. The political class is most times dominated by the men. As a, do you have a policy towards Africa to help African women um, become more represented, become part of the governance of this, become more active in, in politics? Because um, the effect of politics touches everyone's life. If you are not where decisions are made, 
and those decisions affect you, it means you are going to be affected negatively. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. As I said, we are uh, working uh, from our very big, uh, you know, budget for the de development cooperation. A lot of it goes towards women and girls issues, democracy and human rights. So I know that we create network for like local politicians in various countries for women and, and you know, have uh, workshops on how to strengthen them and, and uh, so there are various, I don't know all the programs, but there are various uh, initiatives like this, so this is one of the most important parts of our, of how we do outreach in the world actually is how to, how we strengthen girls and, and um, women, but we can give you more concrete uh, examples uh, if you're interested. Good morning, Ambassador. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Mara Blakesley. I'm a third year student here at the Cronkite School. Um, my question is about freedom of speech. Um, the United States is known to support hate speech in order to protect all speech and not to censor until it incites harm, which is like a conversation we're having after the January 6th incident. So where does Sweden draw the line when it comes to speech? And how do you think Sweden differs from the United States in this way? And in your opinion, um, how can we protect speech, but also create an inclusive and safe environment for everyone? Well, as I said, our Freedom of Speech Act goes back till 1766. Uh, so it's, a, it's something that has been part of the Swedish society for a very long time. And if my co colleagues must correct me if I'm wrong, we have an act that says you are not allowed to defame a group uh, and you're not allowed to defame a person uh, or that then you can be taken to court you're allowed to say whatever you want but you cannot say uh, general negativity about the group as a whole um, so so that's important when you are for instance i remember when uh, uh, with twitter you're also responsible for the twitter not just your own tweet, but also what's coming into this commentary section uh, to make sure that there is nothing of that sort in 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 the feed, your Twitter feed, for instance. So there are legal uh, legal um, uh, laws uh, on this, but in general, uh, it, you know, freedom of speech. You can basically say what you want. Uh, it's it's a very strong right uh, in my society. So I don't know if we're that different from the United States, actually. I would say it's very similar. Did you have a, full, an, a second question as well? Yeah, and uh, safe environment. I mean, I think we, we have to accept that people will not always say nice things <laughs> or things that you like that's how we also have a debate and create uh, you know how politics are done uh, but there's a difference between that of course and and being nasty thank you ambassador my name is johnson mayamba i'm from humphrey fellow from uganda you've mentioned that human rights and democracy uh, once they are promoted, it, it, it equivalents to security. And I was looking at different human rights reports and Sweden ranks very high. Using your position beyond your country and your region as Europe, we I, I personally come from Africa where there is a lot of instability, aspects such as human rights and democracy are not uh, respected in most countries. Uh, beyond offering uh, political asylum and all this refugee status. What is your country doing beyond that to advance these aspects in countries that do not respect them, especially in Africa? Thank you. Well, thank you. First of all, as I said, uh, we, we work a lot through our development agents or development budget uh, to focus on these issues. And then we are, uh, you know, a very supportive member of the United Nations and wherever we can within the United Nations, we use our voice to call out countries that are not respecting human rights and, and democracy and so on. Uh, plus, uh, in, uh, we are one of the, I think together with the United States, we're actually the only country that writes human rights reports about every country in the world <laughs> and we publish them openly. 
uh, and they are, I think they are written in English or Swedish, I don't remember, but they are published online. So that's uh, something uh, that we do, and uh, we, uh, through our, um, through our uh, development cooperation, we also give strong support to activist groups and, and uh, civil society in countries where, where uh, democracy and human rights is uh, weak or being attacked uh, as much as we can. So these are some of the tools that we use. Uh, and we are, I think we're quite frank in our discussions with foreign leaders, where, where, you know, where we see problems. And we have time for one last question. <laughs> you deserve it, give wearing that t-shirt. Yes, <laughs> we had a chance to meet for a couple of minutes. Um, so here's a weird question, and I know it might trigger some people here, but you're the right person to ask this, because you mentioned that it took a male prime minister to declare a feminist government, human rights based government. And you also mentioned, um, so there's a Swedish organization called Men for Jamstel, Men We Working for Equality. And unfortunately, in terms of uh, working with gender equality, I think some attempts can backfire. We can sometimes get sexism, sexist in terms of addressing sexism. Um, and a lot of it manifests in a context such as equating violence to male energy. I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that it was, it's mostly men that have provoked wars and uh, a lot of people have suffered against it. So my question to you is how aggressive do you think we should get in terms of creating gender equality? And do you notice that some of our attempts to solve the problem can actually create more problem? And I think Sweden is an interesting example in terms of working with that because you've had champions uh, such as Dag Hamasho, the former Secretary General that has inspired so many people and has shown that maybe sometimes it's a matter of deconstructing concepts versus creating more concepts about how we can uh, co-create co a better reality. Well, I think this is a very difficult question, of course, but given that women are 50% or aren't we even 51% of the population in the planet? I mean, this just cannot be right. We must have exactly the same rights as men. Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, I know it's not like that in, in all parts of the world, of course, but I really do believe uh, that. I, I, it's not the belief, I know it has to be that. But of course, we are also uh, tackling a lot of difficult issues. And what we see is that young, uh, mostly young men, if we look today, more, more girls go on and are studious and go to universities or educate themselves, men to a lesser, or boys to a lesser degree today. Uh, there seems to be a, a frustration among young men and, uh, and also it's not easy to always get a job once you're out of school. I mean, there are many things that also feeds this kind of group and gang mentality. I mean, there's so many layers to this. So it's, I think you have to have a very broad policy uh, so many to tools as possible to, to do something about this. Because it is true that young men are more violent than young girls, for instance, uh, if that's a biological thing, or it's a systemic thing, or whatever it is, we have to look at into all aspects of it, because it is really a problem. And as I said, um, organized crime in Sweden, uh, a lot of young men are involved and how, what what do we as a society do to change the possibilities so that these young men see other possibilities in instead of channeling that energy into these sectors and i think it's really one of the biggest uh, things we have to tackle going forward um, so it is difficult but i hope you as journalists can keep holding governments accountable and and uh, really uh, unveiling all the layers of these problems that we have to to deal with and do something about we seem to have just a couple more minutes so i'll ask one more question thank you ambassador for being with us i'm anam from pakistan i'm a humphrey fellow and work for a tv uh, in pakistan you mentioned how sweden is working for gender equality and you also mentioned that you are the first female ambassador of Sweden to the United States. We, in my country, we're also making efforts 
uh, to achieve gender equality and there are international organizations who are striving for it, not in my country, but in the world. Um, what do you think about the pace of progress of achieving gender equality? Do you think results should be different if we see the efforts? Um, in your opinion, where is the gap? Thank you. Absolutely, it's way too slow. <laughs> I think it's uh, awful. Uh, I, I, and I know that these things take time. But look, just look in my country. It's that it's in 2017 was a thing that a female could become the ambas first ambassador to the United States. That should have happened long time ago. Uh, that it's even an issue annoys me. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm very proud to be that person. Uh, but, you know, we got voting rights 100 years ago. <laughs> and uh, it's, I, I think it's way too slow. Um, so we must do everything we can, I think, to, to be able to create equal rights. I know it sounds naive, and I know it's very difficult in very many places. It's even difficult in my country, even though we are so advanced. It's not a given. We are still not having equal pay for equal work. OK, it's not very big difference, but there's still a difference. And that we even have that is terrible, I think. So I think it must go much faster. We, uh, we cannot rest till, till we, we have that. And then, I mean, then, of course, there are so many minority groups uh, you know, that are having uh, difficulties. And, and, and there's so much to do, of course. But I, I really think it's important. We have to do, we have to work faster, much faster. And we are all responsible for making it happen. Thank you. Please join me, everyone, in saying thank you to the ambassador for being here with us today. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with our wonderful students. Oh, and thank you for being so interested. Uh, this was fantastic. And uh, good luck to all of you. You are, you are super important uh, to the world. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. That was great. Thank you so much.